Hello, one and all, and welcome to the 2021 edition of The Nonprofits. And I know that we already aired an episode in 2021. Don't at me. This is the first show that we're recording in 2021. And I don't think Johnny said anything about it last week. So I'm I'm taking that. Welcome to 2021, everybody. How are you doing, Malty, Cynthia, and Mendisa? As well as could be expected today, I think. Um, we're recording this on Wednesday the uh, the 6th. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, today's been a little bit of a rough day mentally, emotionally, just I think for a lot of people. But um, hopefully we can kind of power through it. How are um, you feeling? Well, I will say that here in Georgia, um, it's a bit of a sigh of relief and a bit rough as well because um, the runoff election produced two new Democratic senators in Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. So, um, you know, Georgia is officially blue, a blue state. Um, most of the state voted blue, and which does help the administration that's coming in. And so, you know, it's been a long, hard road for that, you know, plenty of voting ads in the mail. And, you know, um, so there is, there's just been a lot going on. And I know that what's going on in Washington is probably a direct result of that, among other things. So we're seeing people who are resistant to a certain amount of change that's coming. Uh, they don't like to see it coming. And, um, you know, so we're, we're you know, it, it's it's very interesting to see what's happening. Uh, for some of us, it, it is new, mm -hmm. but um, we're now seeing this new tide that's coming in that many of us are ready for, but we, as we can, as we can see mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. I know I, I woke up pretty excited. The first thing I did, I, I went and I checked Politico. I saw that they had called one of the two Senate races in Georgia, breathed my little sigh of relief. And when I saw that the the other race uh, had the Democrat in the lead, and I'm, I'm just you know, feeling like, oh, man, this is the first, you know what, 2021's already looking up, right? It's little little bit. It's I'd love to say it's the small things, but I guess this one was actually a pretty big thing. So very thankful there. And Cynthia, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I guess I'm doing uh, pretty well. Um, today was a very, um, I don't know what today was. I, I have no like words to really describe it. I, I, you know, one of the things that, uh, when I was like looking at the different events that was happening in uh, Washington, when the election was going on, and I remember like just looking at the different results that were coming at, back by state by state, I was concerned this would happen. And uh, I, was, I was just thinking to myself, I said, you know what, if, um, if Biden wins, I don't know what the MAGA people gonna do. And and I kind of, and then when this whole thing transpired, I, I was just like, oh my gosh, like they actually did what I thought that they were going to do. And I, I, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm, I'm happy that at least uh, a lot of the, you know, turmoil has kind of like died down. Um, I, I'm very saddened about like some of the uh, events that happened, including uh, the person that uh, lost their life. And, and I kind of felt that it was, you know, unnecessary. Uh, I do support any person's, you know, right to, you know, to assemble, to protest, and to even speak their minds on things that they don't agree with. But, you know, there's a line, and unfortunately, it was crossed today. And and I'm just hoping that somewhere or some way that we can find the, to this to be a teachable moment. And now exactly what that is right now, I, I don't know, but, you know, hopefully we can find like, you know, some silver lining in all of this and, and hopefully, you know, a, a chance for us to kind of move forward together. Um, and, and I am uh, uh, pleased uh, in, a, in, in some cases with Georgia, because now 
Mitch McConnell is a senator, senator minority leader. So good job, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and on that note, you know, we've, we've all kind of danced around it a little bit, but before we really get the show started, I do want to just touch on what happened today. Like Malty said, we're recording today on Wednesday, January 6th. And for everybody in the know, um, and probably those not in the know, there was a violent protest today at the Capitol building while the electoral votes were being officially counted in what's realistically uh, pretty much just a, it's not even a major process. It's mostly just ceremonial, to be honest. Um, it was really frightening, uh, heartbreaking. I was watching the news, you know, messaging back and forth with my friends. We're all just in, I'd love to say disbelief, but at the same time, I think we all kind of knew that something was brewing. Um, the truth is that right now, we don't have a lot of information. We know that one person lost their life. We know that a few other people may have been injured. There were some firearms involved. Curfew was put in place, but things have kind of calmed down. We don't know a ton, and we don't know what the fallout's going to be. We don't know what's going to happen next. These next few days are probably going to be uh, hopefully less crazy, but you never know right now. So we're not going to be diving into this whole Capitol building shindig that happened. Uh, we're not going to be talking about it too much. We may hit on it here and there if it relates, but we're not going out of our way to really hammer that home because by the time this is released, uh, everything might be different. Yeah. So uh, thank you guys for being here with me. I know that just being with, people that I care about right now feels good because uh, like I said, today was definitely a little bit emotionally exhausting for me at least. Yeah. Same. Yeah. It was um, really great to have um, a sense of community that I hadn't seen before um, in, uh, in the um, atheist community of Discord, you know, I had 30 people that were all pretty much sitting together pretty quietly, a little bit of chat in the uh, text chat, but just watching what was going on and um, supporting each other. It was, it was helpful. And that's, I'm so glad to hear that. I had sort of the same thing with some of my coworkers and simultaneously all uh, with some of my friends as well. And we're all here for each other. That's what the point of our community is and for our friends. Um, but let's kick off this episode of the nonprofits. And before we do, I do just have to do a little bit of the boring stuff. The nonprofits is a product of the ACA, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the separation of religion and government and promoting positive atheism. You can support us by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nonprofits. You can join our Facebook group, which I believe is Nonprofits Live. And you can also just reach out. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. There are comments on this video. We do get to them sometimes to varying degrees. And you can also email nonprofits at atheist-community.org. That will go to, I believe, every single host we've got. And you know we'll be able to see it, get your feedback. If we need to, we can respond. Uh, so thank you once again for joining us on this journey. But let's dive in. And to kick things off, Mandisa, you are, I think, a newcomer to the nonprofits. You're the first guest that we're having in 2021, hopefully the first of many. And awesome. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I, I've seen some of the work you've done. I've seen you on Atheist Experience. I've seen uh, some of your collaborations with Seth Andrews. But why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us a little about you. Uh, absolutely. So for those of you who aren't familiar with me, I am the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, which is headquartered in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I am a native of New York City, and I've been a resident of Georgia now for over 20 years. And um, our organization um, is a 
501c3 nonprofit organization that is dedicated to um, providing support for and building community for um, primarily um, Black folks who are atheists or who are questioning religion in favor of leaving, and also advocating for um, you know awareness and raising our voices, increasing our profile um, in many ways. And uh, we've been doing this now for 10 years. So we got started in 2011 and 2021. All year, we are um, we are celebrating 10 years of our existence as an organization. That is awesome. Truly amazing, inspiring. I know that you've inspired a lot of members of um, just even the atheist community of Austin. I'm sure that you helped inspire Cynthia. And I know that uh, you've had an impact on my friend and arch nemesis, Jenna Miu, who is not here with us tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I kid, Jenna and I are cool for all, Never mind. Um, <laughs> so so uh, black non-believers, that's like, that's your thing. And, and you talked a lot about that. And really, I want to dig in on that because it's just such an important organization. And there's, there was a video that I watched that you did, like I said, with Seth Andrews, I think about five years ago. And some of what yes. you said in there was so powerful. And I was just thinking, wow, I didn't realize this before. These aren't things that I knew or had any concept of about how um, the African-American identity in a lot of ways is so innately tied with religion. And in some ways to renounce your religion in some people's minds is almost like renouncing your culture. Do you think you could talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And so I'm just going to say real quick that um, I had the opportunity to review um a you know a document that Pew Research is working on uh, about religion and Black life. Um, it's going to be coming out very shortly, and when I saw it, my heart sank because um, they surveyed over eight thousand people. There were still only a few, a very very minute number of openly identified atheists who responded to the survey, just like the the previous one they did a few years ago. Um, and it speaks to the institutional influence that religion, Christianity in particular, has had on the Black community. And we can certainly trace that back to the enslavement of Africans in this country um, and how that manifested itself in establishing very racist and economically disadvantaged uh, institutions uh, that was that have been perpetuated, and um, it also speaks to how the church just became such an overwhelming influence um, in in the black community, and um, for for valid reasons because for some for for many uh, their faith was all they had. And the church was the only institution that allowed for prominence or it allowed for this idea of community um, and, uh, and, and unity to an extent. Um, I wouldn't say that that's entirely the case, but for many that has that for in the black community has been the case. And that has continu continued down throughout the centuries. And so there is really is such an emotional tie to the church and religion within the black community, even in questioning those beliefs, even in questioning Christianity and how damaging it has been. Um, there's still this sense of, well, I need to hold on to this, uh, you know, this belief, this belief in God has got us through so much turmoil and, and so many challenges. And, uh, and it, it's as if it's supposed to be encoded in our DNA that we're supposed to believe um, because this is what our ancestors have always done. And mm -hmm. so when you not just question it, but you renounce those beliefs, when you say that you do not believe in God whatsoever, when you say the dreaded word or quote unquote dreaded word of atheist, um, that can be, um, that, that can come with, it already comes with significant challenges, um, just period. Um, but I remember 
uh, five years ago when a woman got up in my face and she said that she couldn't believe that as a black woman, I had the nerve to identify as an atheist in front of white devils and that I had a slave mentality. So, uh, you know, it was like, I was, you know, I was absolutely betraying our community. Like, how dare I? And mm -hmm. this is what others feel. This is what many other black folks deal with. Uh, to even approach the conversation, to even say that you don't believe anymore. You're just inundated with all of this, you know, all of this religious and, and spiritual junk. And so it, it's it's very. There are many who feel isolated. There are many who feel like they're alone, and uh, and that actually isn't true. I mean, historically, there have always been non-believers. There have always been humanists. There have always been atheists in our community. Even though we are still very outnumbered, we are here. And the purpose of Black non-believers is to show that there are more of us out here. That there have we have always been here. Uh, it's about re-educating folks. It's about reshaping the narrative and showing that there is absolutely not only that there is that there is nothing wrong with being an atheist, but that more people need to accept that. That more people need to 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 hear our views and know that we are out here and that we are actually building community. We're creating content. We are collaborating. We are doing this work. Hmm. That's great. I, uh, so important. Go go ahead, Multi, please. Well, um, it came to mind that there are some versions of Christianity, uh, the Jehovah's Witness, the um, the Mormons, who have uh, I I think of as those that will ostracize um, people who leave the faith. I hadn't heard it so much about, um, say, the Southern Baptists, or, but you're saying that this is something that is um, prevalent in in the Black Christian community as well. Absolutely, um, you have uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses who will excommunicate you if you, you know, if you question or, or what have you. There are many in the Black community who will, um, you know, there's always been a sense of community and trying to bring people together, especially as we discuss, you know, racial justice and, and economic, um, um, economic justice and other issues that uh, impact our community. But it's as if the, the glue that holds us together is supposed to be the church and religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there will be many who try to bring you back into that fold, or there are just many of us who just won't bring it up at all because it's just so overwhelming that it almost shuts you down. So you just don't want to say anything in, the in certain. Um, yes, the, the yes, many in the, in the culture, and and I grew up in uh, the Black conscious community where there was less Christianity, but there was still a lot of spirituality. Mm. And so, with that, is this underlying idea at times that there is still this sense of belief um, holding on to. There's a lot of ancestor worship. You know, there's a lot that um, you know that that is um, tied into some sort of divine intervention in some way. And so you almost feel like you can't escape it and that you feel that, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, it isn't even worth having the conversation at times. Mm -hmm. So it's like you just, you almost just kind of get along, you almost kind of get along the go along at times. And it's hard, it, it has been very difficult to find that space where you can find other like-minded individuals who not just don't who, who don't just believe at all, but you can also discuss evidence-based um, ideas with and and other things that tend to be dismissed um, or looked down upon within the black community. So there's there's layers that may not be understood from the outside looking in, but that we still have to deal with nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious if Cynthia, do you have any experience with that yourself? Did you when you left religion, did you feel any of that or did you have more of a smooth transition? Where where did your experience take you? So, um I was kind of lucky. And I think that the reason being is because um I was raised Episcopal. So, um my family although our identify as Christian, 
it's not like a hardline Christianity, if, if that makes sense. So I remember when I was saved and I was in a more charismatic faith that came out of um, a, a tradition of the Church of God in Christ, which is um, like the Pentecostal uh, uh, Black version. And, um, and I can just imagine that if I were... If like, if like, say, for instance, if my, my, my entire family was kind of like raised or, or you know, uh, gilded to that tradition, it would have been a lot harder for me. Um, so when I when I left the church, I left the church in my 30s, but I was still identifying as a Christian. I didn't really come out as atheist until like my early 40s. Um, so I'm a fairly new atheist. Um, however... I, I still have um, had like the sly uh, underlining uh, remarks from people who I used to practice Christianity with uh, concerning my non-belief. Um, you know, even if I posted something like on Instagram of me doing yoga, because I love yoga, and, you know, I would still have like a, a former uh, practitioner say, well, you know, sis, Jesus, this is the only way. And um, I wanted to give a shout out, Mandiza, to your, um, uh, it was a podcast that you did with a panel. I want to, uh, it's on your website. Uh, it, I believe it was the uh, Christianity, White Supremacy and True Liberation. And True Liberation. Yes. And yeah, and there was this panelist that, uh, that mentioned uh, how oftentimes, like you will hear specifically in a, a black conscious community, oftentimes like about Jesus being a black man, and I believe that one of your panelists said that well, if, if Jesus was black, he got a lot of explaining to do, and <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, uh, proverbial amen, because <laughs> you're you know one of the things that I don't think that a lot of people like to really discuss is how. You know, white supremacy power structure, specifically in America and in, in abroad in some cases, um, absolutely go hand in hand with white Christianity or with, with Christianity, period. And th a lot of the panelists really brought up some really excellent points on how, you know, this specific religion had been used um, in, in so many different cases as, as, a, as a yoke on the consciousness of, of Black America. And, and I would even say that that's something that we still experience today. And, and it was kind of interesting, uh, Mandisa, that you brought up, you know, doing the work with the Pew Research, pre Pew Research because I, I recently looked up um, like the numbers when it comes to like, you know, how we identify between like, you know, religious and non-religious, even though like the black community, I believe right now it's like about 18% non-religious, we're still only 1% that actually would say that we're atheists. And that's mm -hmm. actually, I think it's less than 1% if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And and yep. we still got about uh, close to 80% of the community that still identify as Christian. And, and to me, I think that that says a lot uh, about how these particular institutions that we still fight to this particular day because of, um, because of not being on equal footing um, are still playing into a uh, positionality of black folk in America and, and, and also still has a very much so vice script on how we live our lives and how we actually, you know, think about like what we should and should not do. I, I even remember like screaming at sometimes that like some of these other uh, black reverend leaders um, that would even uh, try to advocate on our behalf, and they and, it's, and to me they seem just so docile, and and I'm wondering, oftentimes, and accusing them of like, you know, did your white Jesus tell you to do this, you know, and and um, mm -hmm. and and it's yeah, so yeah, that makes me mad. But anyway, <laughs> but like My, I'm, me too, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, but I'm very. Um, I know that like, but for me, especially like, you know, just trying to figure this whole space out. Um, one of the first organizations that I came across was the Black Nonbelievers. So I'm personally grateful for the work that you have done um, because, you know, a lot of the content and, you know, and just like, you know, having a space uh, for Black atheists uh, to really just come to figure it out, 
you know, it makes a it makes a huge difference. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I have to tell you how much getting involved in this community has just changed me. You know, um, it wasn't truly my intention to actually start Black Nonbelievers. I really thought that as a overall secular community that we could, you know, work more together. And we have. Many of us have. Um, there's no doubt about that. But when it came to issues that particularly affected Black folks, Black folks who are coming out of religion, especially dealing with the institutional factors that we deal with, you know, in, in addition to, there was an extreme lack of understanding. There was an extreme um, dismissal um, that, that, I, that I noted. And, um, and while there were a lot of questions about, you know, diversity and inclusion and what that looked like, it certainly, there certainly was a disparity there. And so it wasn't just because, well, we just felt like starting it. It was because it was needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it really, really is and, and was because there, it, it, it makes a difference when you see more people who can identify directly with what you go through. Um, and, and that we are organizing, you know, there, there is a difference there. There's a difference in how we do things. And I'm unapologetic about that. I am a product of the black community and my organization reflects that. Mm -hmm. And, um, there is, there are some things that other organizations may not take into account when they are doing, um, you know, whether they're doing their programming or what the subject matter is. It certainly doesn't mean that we don't align because many times we do. But when it comes to also the scholarship, when it comes to, again, the content, when it comes to who is also doing work, um, that also needed to be more developed and more amplified. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that now there are more more black folks and people like yourself who are now hosting um, on platforms and creating content uh, because there have been more of us out here doing this work, just like I saw it when I came in the community. And I just wanted, I just wanted to lend my hand to that work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when you mentioned the, um, you know, the, the uh, Christianity, white supremacy and true liberation, uh, one of the people who I had on there, we had on there was Jeremiah Kamara. And I, he was very inspirational to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when I came to re-identifying as an atheist um, mm -hmm. and, and really becoming more outspoken about it. And I've always been an outspoken individual, but uh, when it came to particularly how religion has impacted the black community. That was where I really found my strength and seeing more of us who are doing it. Because even at the time that I got involved, there were still very few that I knew of, even though now we know there are more out there. And mm -hmm. so um, there is strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. There is strength in knowing that there are others who get it and identify and that we engage each other and that we help each other. I mean, we're still a small community and even though the numbers of religious nuns are rising, not all of them include atheists. And so uh, it's good for us, you know, to build on that and then branch out and connect with other entities. And that's what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. So you are, you're talking about working, you know, showing the, um, the presence of black non-believers or black atheists. Um, this is part of the advocacy work that you're doing that is is helping um, yes. people come out of the religion, so showing that they have support or they have community? Absolutely, for people who are coming out of religion or even if they are fully atheist, but they felt isolated, they didn't think anyone else was out there who could relate and identify because many black atheists will tell you that they thought they were the only ones, um, that it is difficult to find other black atheists. And even today that is still true, like in real time. Mm -hmm. um, when I got involved, I saw that there were black atheist groups on social media, um, but as far as meeting in person, actually connecting with each other in real time, that was still very lacking. And so that was 
that is what was needed to be rectified. And yes, the advocacy and the organized efforts, um, there were some when I first got involved, you had African Americans for Humanism, which was a program of the Center for Inquiry. You had Black Atheists of America. Uh, you also have Black Skeptics uh, Los Angeles. Um, and we were only intended to be local to the Atlanta area because that's where we were trying to build up more of a community and more of an organized community in the Atlanta area. Um, that our, our scope expanded. Um, soon after, which which was great, um, but uh, that definitely is a part of what we do. And and Pete and I'll tell you, having those connections is important. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing that there are other people that you can just meet with, even on a social level, is extremely important because once you are able to um, really come to that place where you can accept that identity, not that you're trying to get others to accept it, but that you accept it for yourself because that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And also knowing that there are others who have been where you are and that we are helping on this journey together, that strengthens folks. And that also strengthens, again, our, our community. And so, um, so yes, um, there are folks who came who have come to that conclusion, um, but they are still um, perhaps uh, hesitant to say so openly because they didn't realize that there were others out there and they're also still surrounded or also their livelihoods depend on the religious people around them. And so, um, you know, that, that does, that is important. It does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you mentioned that there was a, this is the 10th anniversary. This year is the 10th anniversary of Black non-believers. So congratulations, first and foremost. And Thank there's you. some sort of celebratory conference going on. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Absolutely, yes. So um, the weekend of uh, from January 15th through the 17th, we are hosting our 10th anniversary celebration. Uh, we are doing a hybrid event. Uh, we will be having a smaller in-person gathering in New Orleans. Um, it will be uh, safe and we will be practicing social distancing and following the safety protocols. Um, but we also, it will be uh, streamed virtually. And so half of our speakers will be presenting remotely. Uh, we do have Jeremiah Kamara, who was one of our day ones. Uh, we also have Sakivu Hutchinson, uh, Chris Cameron, also uh, Daryl Ray and uh, Anthony Magna Bosco, who also um, works with the ACA. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a combination similar to our fifth anniversary back in 2016. Uh, we feature activists, organizers, content creators. Uh, we also are featuring our first ever Hurston Scholarship winner that we co-sponsored with the Secular Student Alliance, uh, a student at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, a young lady who openly identifies as a non-believer. So it's about um, presenting those who have been involved, who are doing the research, and who are also coming up, you know, trying to pave the way for that leadership pipeline. And so uh, we're, we're doing it, you know, it, it's a very much a combination of things. It isn't just a party, something that we're just getting together. And even though that will be a part of it, but it will be very educational. It will be very informative. And you get an opportunity to see it more of, to go in, in, in more depth into the work that we've done, the alliances that we've built, and also the members who have benefit from being a part of our organization. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited for more people to see that and to actually get a better idea of what we've been doing. That is amazing. And just being able to both pull this off during such trying times as COVID and also just uh, putting together such an awesome panel. I think it's it sounds like it's going to be a really amazing event and uh, I'm going to have to buy my ticket. Um, at yes. this point, at this point, I know that we could probably keep going on like this for forever. You definitely could. Uh, but um, 
we do have a few other topics that we were looking to talk about today, so I do want to start to move on. But I do want to remind everybody, in case they didn't know, Mandis is awesome, Black Non-Believers is awesome, and the ACA is currently running a fundraiser for Black Non-Believers. If you do want to contribute to that, you can do it directly through YouTube on this week's episode of Truth Wanted or Talk Heathen that already aired or the Atheist Experience episode that's coming up next, which will also feature Mandisa Thomas. We are so excited about that. Um, but let's talk about something that's maybe a little less exciting, more exciting. I don't know. Uh, Malti, why don't you mm. take us away with Christian nationalism's COVID vaccine doubt threatens America's herd immunity? Yeah. Um, so um, this article comes to us um, from NBC News. Um, just came out this last week, and uh, there'll be a, a link to the article itself in the show notes. So please check it out when you get a chance. It's um, working off of de um, describing work done by um, a couple of social scientists, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Um, and um, what they were talking about is um, trying to find ways of identifying people who may um, be hesitant to, um, to take this COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and that they found Christian nationalism is a very strong um, indicator of people's uh, views on whether or not they should become vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. And there's... You mean a cup of blood isn't enough? That's, yeah, <laughs> we're going to get into that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the there, blood. Oh, the there blood. is a lot about the... COVID-19 vaccine that makes people scared. And I'll admit, like even myself, I am I am not an anti-vaxxer in any way, shape or form. I am a skeptic. I generally trust the findings of the scientific community. And when I first started hearing about the COVID vaccine, I was a little nervous about getting it because it sounded so different. It sounded so different than what we're usually used to just things that go through years of rigorous testing before they come to market. Something that comes up in less than a year, is that safe if they built this from the ground up? And it wasn't until I really started to learn more about it and dig into it more that I really started to understand, okay, well, these mRNA vaccines are things that we've actually been studying and utilizing for decades. We just don't see them quite as commonly right now. And it, I get it. I get why people are skeptical, but it also, I find it hard to believe that people think it can get that much worse, right? We've already been locked down for what, nine months now, going on 10 months or something like that. We we can't go to the grocery store without having to wipe everything down. We We still can't really see our friends or our family. We can't travel life is not what we want it to be right now. So I struggle to realize, I struggle to imagine how somebody can be skeptical to the point of just flat out saying, I would not trust it, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, they, they do, um, there's a group of people which may make up up to a quarter of the Christian population in the U.S. Um, that kind of fit into this um, Christian nationalist um, box, if you will, that um, the uh, the authors of the paper were trying to uh, elucidate, um, and that um, they the couple things that are the similar in all of them is that there's a per pervasive ideology that rejects scientific authority. And they also, that's kind of, and then there's also a part that promotes allegiance to a conservative political leader. Um, so that's what they were using, um, Whitehead and Perry were using for their uh, definition of what an American Christian nationalist was. Um, so the feeling things like scientists are hostile to faith, 
creationism should be taught in public schools and the US relies too much on scientists, on, on science over religion in making decisions on policy or politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the other side, I'm promoting allegiance to conservative political leaders. There's a, uh, an allegiance to a conservative uh, ideal set and the authority in the public sphere should come from sources that they trust are friendly to religion and not secularism. Uh, this was a, an interesting paper to dig into. I'm not a social scientist by any means, but I think it was somewhat reasonable, readable. Um, and the paper and the US, uh, excuse me, and NBC um, article that uh, describes it. Um, I found it interesting, some of the questions that were actually um, highlighted uh, when they were talking about uh, the uh, vaccine attitudes versus Christian, na Christian nationalism and how like some of the things that they like, some of their findings were, you know, kind of correlated. And as far as like the vaccination attitudes, uh, I found these interesting. I'm just going to read them off from the article. It said that uh, vaccines cause autism. This one of the attitudes that they have. Uh, doctors and drug companies are not honest about the risk of vaccines. Uh, people have the right to decide whether or not to vaccinate their kids. I, I've heard that so many times. Um, kids are given too many vaccines. I, I don't know how many times have I heard that as well. And uh, vaccines do not help protect children from dangerous diseases and to measure Christian um, nationalism. They also combine uh, some of the questions that they asked them into a single scale. Uh, and some of those were, uh, some of the answers that came from that were like, uh, they felt that uh, the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation. Uh, the, federal, <laughs> the federal government should advocate for Christian values. Uh, they should in, enforce strict separation of church and state. They should, um, they should, uh, I'm sorry. They should, um, they should enforce, um, they should not enforce a, a strict separation of church and state. They should be like together. And like uh, the, gov the federal government should allow prayer in public schools. Uh, they should also allow religious symbols in public places. And they also, and they, um, and I remember like the ending quote that really like kind of got me in this whole thing was that a uh, Christian nationalist ideology will almost uh, certainly uh, serve as a barrier for a sizable minority of Americans who re actually really need the vaccine. Even like when we were going back to like, you know, how many people are like identifying as Christians. Um, and I know that we're probably we're going to get into this a little bit with the next article that, um, you know, that belong to communities that have been severely wrecked by COVID-19, but because of some of their uh, ideologies, um, that's going to keep them from actually getting the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, just a little clarification, what the, uh, in the paper, how culture war, how culture wars delay herd immunity, mm -hmm. Christian nationalism and anti-vaccine attitudes um, the authors took these questions and um, asked the people to rate them from um, do not agree, strongly do not agree to um, highly agree, you know, one through five scale. Mm -hmm. And then so on those first vaccine questions, that would kind of give you a feeling of the people's um, I, feelings on vaccines. And then they would ask them the, the, the questions about Christian nationalism. And the same thing, a one through five square, I'll d agree or disagree. And when you total up the, the, the those two, then you can get a metric to see if they correlate, if they w work together. And they found that they, they, they do trend very tightly. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I can't necessarily say that I'm surprised. And I, I'm sure that we've all experienced this to some extent, but I think it's pretty obvious that in a lot of more extreme religious ideologies, uh, you do see a lot of science denialism, whether that is evolution or that is flat earth or uh, round earth, I guess would be what they're denying, um, or, or so many other things that we in the scientific community would know, hey, th this is kind of a settled issue. We don't really need to think about this anymore. Vaccines are one of those things. There's been so much research that's been done 
And at this point, pretty much all of those arguments are settled. But like yeah. I said, I, I, I just I can't be surprised by it when yeah, Facebook I know this is kind a of thing. people. Yeah, Facebook is a thing. The the mom scientific research of Google. <laughs> yeah, and it's also based on um, having this mentality of when you when you're already in a community where you're just supposed to accept whatever is told to you um, that transfer over to other information. And so, unfortunately, when you have, you know, when when, when we have this. Um, you know, this, this, this plethora of either misinformation, bad information, you know, some information that is mixed in with other unfounded. Um, so, and, and unfortunately, when you have this, uh, when you have people who have this mentality of, well, I'm just going to, you know, if it doesn't sound good, I'll either reject it or they're going to, you know, they go into confirmation bias mode. I think that that's part of it as well. So there are a number of things that play into why there is a lot of denialism um, and also why people choose to absolutely believe the worst about vaccines, uh, which can be a danger mm -hmm. to everyone around them. So um, yeah, there's there's a there's a number of things. Um, certainly, the beliefs play a huge role. The institution of religion plays a huge role in in that. Um, but it also transfers over into how people look at other information. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're seeing that it's a very dangerous trend, especially now. Yeah, just looking to um, an authority figure and not looking to understand the best you can the and make um make educated uh, decisions upon yourself at all at all you you get truth from a higher power not truth from knowledge and granted i mean i i know that it's not a perfect system but i want to believe that i can trust the doctors and that i can trust the sciences the the scientists right i mean i I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I don't work in the medical field. I work in the tech field. I didn't go to school for that. I rely on the fact that other people went to school and other people studied really hard and spent years and years of their life slaving away uh, to get the education that they need to make these informed decisions and to figure this stuff out so that I don't have to do it myself. Because I know that my Google searches are not equivalent to that. So I really want to, to be able to trust these things. And I, I guess that the turning point for me was once the medical community, because I, I, I feel like at the beginning, I was hearing even a little bit of unrest from the medical community. Dr. Fauci was saying that he didn't think a vaccine could be produced that fast and, and things like that. And eventually the tone shifted to, oh, hey, we've actually kind of got something to, oh, we have it. It's here maybe a little longer than certain presidents say it'll be, but it's here, it's coming, it's on the way. And that's really when I, I got the feeling of, okay, it's time. No more hesitations with this. If the vaccine's ready, I'm getting it. And, mm -hmm. Well, after the people who are more at risk than I am. But when I can, I'm getting it. Uh, but that's not the case for everybody. Not everybody wants to or really can trust doctors in the way that I have always been able to. Uh, and that, I think, leads us straight to our second article, which, uh, Cynthia, can you maybe kick us off? Sure. Uh, so the next article that uh, we were just going to go over uh, is called History of Medical Testing Has Left Many African Americans Hesitant About the New COVID-19 Vaccine. Uh, this is on, um, I want to say, Cup. Uh, capradio.org. I believe that's, uh, if, you know, if anybody wants to go ahead and correct me, I'm pretty sure that I went ahead and butchered that, but, you know, all the links of the articles are going to be in the show notes below. All right. So, <laughs> um, so this particular article uh, basically uh, starts off with the uh, young man who's a, a special education teacher who uh, talked about his misgivings uh, concerning vaccines. Um, and he cited um, 
some of the reasons why he had issues is because he had a, I want to say an uncle. Yeah, it was an uncle who was incarcerated. And when he was let out of jail, um, and he was having a hard time, like, you know, getting money, you know, it's very difficult to actually like, you know, find a job, making a, um, a decent wage. And so what he would do for money was basically offer himself as a medical guinea pig. And, um, and it was just doing all these particular trials, they would shoot him up with all types of different things. And, and even though his uncle never reported that um, he had any like adverse health effects from, you know, lending himself uh, to these particular, you know, uh, different medical studies, uh, the the very fact that he had to do that for money in the first place was already like a like a cry of like, this is this, something is like a problem with this. Like he, he specifically called his uncle like a like the crash test dummy for, you know, uh, for these particular medical studies. And and the, and the article actually cites like, you know, um, some of the studies that were done specifically by the uh, Public Policy Institute of California that suggested that only 29% of African Americans in the state would definitely or probably get a COVID vaccine. And the low confidence uh, among this racial group is like a, a stark contrast of 54% of Latinos who said they would get it, 60% of whites, and 70% of Asian Californians who said the same. Um, and and also this the um the article goes on to cite some of the mistrust that you know a lot of African Americans would have when it comes to the um, to the medical industry, uh, mm -hmm. citing you know different studies uh, that happen, like specifically the Tuskegee uh, uh, syphilis study, and um, just to give like a, a quick overview of that, this is a study that started in the 1930s uh, specifically to uh, black sharecroppers in Alabama who had syphilis, and um, what they would do is they would promised them like, you know, uh, free medical care in exchange for their participation, but they never treated them for syphilis. And, um, and oftentimes a lot of people ended up, um, some of them like went like, they, you know, they had, they suffered severe mental issues and other uh, scarring that has happened to them. And that particular study went on for 40 years. And, um, and, and even though like there was a treatment for syphilis at that particular time, they never got it. And they even uh, talked uh, further on about some of the other um, issues that happened in the Black community. Like, I know I'm pretty sure that a lot of people were heard about, you know, Henrietta Lacks and, and, and how mm -hmm. her spells basically went all over the world and 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 she never even knew it um and mm -hmm. um and, and just and it just goes on and on and, and talks a little bit more about you know how like some of you know uh people who were in the african-american community said that yes i would get it because you know the different studies that were happening with mr m mrna or messenger rna uh virus um not viruses, um, vaccines, I'm sorry, um, they, you know, had a chance to, you know, kind of get into the research a little bit and, and also talk to other professionals about, you know, the vaccine and, you know, and how, as you all mentioned previously, these particular vaccines have been around for decades. It's just that it was developed for specifically for COVID-19 here for right now. Um, and they would say like, you know, they, they feel um, you know, uh, 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 less trepidatious about getting it, but, you know, you still have like a lot of people in this particular group that said that, you know, nope, not going to do it. And, and it's kind of even, uh, 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 even like more, uh, concerning, especially like, uh, citing how many, um, African-Americans specifically have, you know, have been infected and the mortality rates in um, Black communities being so high with COVID-19. And, you know, a, a lot of times, like, the different um, comorbidities that come with that, like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, asthma, um, happens to disproportionately affect the Black community. And, um, and they see a, a total correlation, specifically even with asthma, on how uh, once like the uh, virus actually settles into the system and how it can just basically ravage it um, to the point where, you know, people um, are more likely to get infected, more mortality rates and in, in going on forward. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's basically like an overview of that particular article. Yeah, I had heard of the Tuskegee and um, 
experiments, but I did not realize that they were ongoing into the 1970s mm -hmm. for Correct. a treatable uh, disease. Right. It continued to, they continued to do the study even after penicillin um, was, was, um, was developed as a treatment. And uh, I am, you know, it was ruled unethical definitely and stopped in the 70s because I, um, uh, from what I've learned about syphilis is that, you know, you have the first stage, then the secondary stage and the tertiary, tertiary stage, which lasts up until you get older. And so, but unfortunately what they did was they took advantage of poor, uneducated black folks in rural Alabama. Mm -hmm. And they probably did not know what they were signing or what they were. Um, and the problem is that they were going out, probably infecting more people without even realizing what was going on. And I think that that was that was definitely a part of the issue. There was the public health crisis that it caused. And um, um, I, I just really think that there are a lot of people who get um, the information about the Tuskegee syphilis study incorrect. You know, no one was intentionally uh, or deliberately injected with the disease. They weren't right. deliberately infected with it. The thing was, it was a study. And the problem was that it was they were taking advantage of, of Black folks in a rural and, and poor community. And right. that was the problem. And yeah. so that was the, the main problem, among other things. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so and yes, I, I do think that Perhaps if it had not been black folks, it might have been it might have ended a long time ago or, or yeah. before it did. Yeah. And, um, you know, when we talk about the hesitance of many in the black community to take the vaccine, uh, we also have to consider how, you know, the healthcare system disproportionately denies many black folks of, of more adequate health care and right. how many doctors may not take our um who may not may not take our health issues seriously. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there is there is definitely that that mistrust on, on that end is as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's warranted, right? It's it's warranted as far as like you know why black people would have such a high distrust of the um, of the medical community, um, and 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 especially like when we're going today talking about how. Um, and and we have data to show uh, to show the correlation of implicit bias when it comes to healthcare. Uh, uh, depend, uh, depending on, you know, what race you belong to. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you all were familiar. Uh, I believe that one of our sub articles talked about a doctor that was, I, I want to say that she was in, um, in Indiana, I want to say, mm -hmm. in Carlisle, Indiana, Indiana. And, um, and how she was stricken with COVID-19 and how she was basically advocating for herself up into her death. The doctor didn't want to give her any pain medication. He was trying to send her home with a with this high fever. Um, she kept telling him, "I'm in pain, I'm in pain," but he he didn't want to give her any narcotics. And 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 what kind of cra was really crazy about it is that, and and I understand how like you know some doctors may want to be a little. Um, uh, cautious, especially um, with like the opioid crisis. But, you know, this woman didn't have a history of, of, of substance use. She was a you know? doctor. For she was sake. a doc. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She was yeah. a doctor and she had to uh, oftentimes f before like the doctor would break down to give her anything, she would have to describe her particular symptoms in medical terminology to show that she's not just, you know, just pulling stuff out her butt, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, 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 and unfortunately that is still very much a thing that's going on to this very day. So, and, and, and I remember, um, even when we're talking about, you know, Black folk being skeptical specifically even about this vaccine, um, you know, one of the things that um, that I know that we talk about a lot, even like in the clinic I work with because I'm a social worker, um, we, we talk about a lot of times like how can we as an organization partner with other organizations to actually 
break down these barriers of mistrust in marginalized communities. And, and oftentimes, we still have people at the top, and I'm going to mention something that Dr. Fauci said uh, when he said that I get your skeptical, but you got to put away your skepticism right now because you know this is what we're doing. And to me, and, and I know I'm paraphrasing, but the way that he said it, and even the words that he utilized were very insensitive. It's really up to the medical industry to really reach out to these communities in order for them to actually rebuild the distrust because it was the industry in the first place that uh, created these barriers in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, even when you are talking about um, not even having proper health care or clinics or other hospitals that are in these communities, you know, I, I I remember like specifically, I live like two minutes from a hospital and um I'm and I'm in a predominantly, you know, black uh community. And they were talking about closing down the hospital that was near me and some other hospitals that were in um uh, in African American communities and uh building a nicer one in um, the South Loop of Chicago. And the South Loop of Chicago is a regentrified area, you know, that um, that has uh, more people of affluence that live there. So you can imagine cutting down these particular hospitals and clinics so that people have to go so far in order for them to be able to get health care. And even though the city of Chicago is pretty connected as far as like transportation is concerned, depending on where you stay would determine the schedule of the, uh, of the, of the transportation that you're going to get. Or, or again, if we're talking about people who don't necessarily have like, you know, like money like that, they don't have a higher income, they don't have wealth you know, sometimes even having a car or even finding somebody to take you to the hospital is going to be an issue, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I know that we fought it tooth and nail. And so they decided not to cut down our hospital, thank goodness. But still, just for, to me, that was a great insult that they, that was seen as something that was even proposed in the first place, especially citing the data when it comes to even being able to access quality health care in these particular communities. Yeah. In in 2010 um, is where I think a uh, a large media surge um, came forth, trying to uh, highlight um, Henrietta Henry and um, Henrietta Lacks and, Henrietta Lacks and what um, the the amount of medical research and knowledge that has been gained over the years since her death because of the HeLa cells that were taken from her without her um, knowledge or um, is is immense. And um, as you were saying, uh, Cynthia, how that the this implicit bias that the healthcare system is that's where it needs to start to change. I, I'd like to give a little glimmer of light, a little glimmer of hope in that the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute, which is a very large biomedical research organization, stepped forth this year um, on the 29th of October to um, present the um, Henrietta Lacks Foundation, a six-figured gift. Um, it was not to uh, disclose the exact amount, but um, the a representative from the HS uh, that Howard Hughes Medical Institute says, quote, we felt it was right to acknowledge Henrietta for the use of HeLa cells and to acknowledge that the cells were gained inappropriately and to acknowledge that we have a long way to go before science and medicine are really equitable. Hmm. Uh, and I hear from a, a one of Henrietta's granddaughters said, I can't speak for everyone, but I know that some family members are grateful for this gift. Hopefully other institutions will follow suit. So um, yeah, I, I actually grew HeLa cells um, while learning biology at, at university. And this was just a small private university. So 
um, she's touched a lot of people's lives. Uh, and, you know, I think a huge, um, you know, a huge step towards rebuilding the trust between the black community and the medical community is the acknowledgement of, you know, of these institutional factors, what has happened, and the fact that those who have been practitioners of science and medicine have been biased, yep. even though the method itself isn't and it isn't supposed to be. But yes, there have been many who have been behind um, these, you know, a, a lot of these things who have conducted things in bad faith, for lack of a better word, and that they were affected by the institution of white supremacy, of racism. And I think to just, like you said, like you said before, uh, for Dr. Fauci to just say, well, just, just put your skepticism aside and just do it. Um, that isn't sufficient in creating an understanding as to why there is such a hesitation. I think just stating that, you know what, we understand it, but this is very important. There is a lot at stake here. There are a lot, of, if you, and then also too, I remember that back in the 1930s, um, uh, when when Margaret Sanger, that's another. That's also another uh, sensitive point within the Black community as well. Cynthia, I know you know what I'm talking. You know what I'm talking about um, when it came to birth control and Planned Parenthood. That they actually utilize Black nurses and practitioners, and so that does make a difference as well. Again, who was representing? Who is dispensing the information and how they can actually communicate it? And so, again, the, the communication and understanding is going to be a huge key to breaking down those barriers and getting us to where we need to be, to, to that equity and, and also to um, administering the vaccines and getting people to better understand how it really helps us. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, and I want to kind of put a cap on this, but to do that... I just want to say I'm really mad and for anyone else, you should be mad too that these conditions exist. And I'm mad that I didn't learn about this stuff sooner. I, I, I know that, uh, you know, several of you, I think all of you knew at least a little bit about the Tuskegee experiments uh, or the study that was done before reading these articles. I'd never even heard of it. I've, I've heard of some of the unethical studies. We, we learn about some of these programs like MKUltra that was done. And, and we learn about stuff like that in school. And we get knowledge like that. I've never heard of this. And this is it's the same sort of thing. And I feel like this is something that I should know. This is something mm -hmm. that I should be aware of. This is, I, I don't want to have to go out of my way to find this out. This is something that should be right in front of me. Mm. So that we can do better. We can do more to, to try to help, to try to fight, to try to do what needs to be done. And so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just really frustrated that I find my own knowledge lacking here because I feel like I need to do better. And I feel like as a society, we need to do better. So let's just, let, let's just do what we can. Let's, let's try to keep ourselves educated, can try to learn something new every day and, you know, just check your privilege, make sure that you are trying to look at things from other people's perspectives, because we really need that. We desperately need that in society today. But one person who was really actually very good at breaking down some of these barriers, tried really hard to get more information out there was somebody named Ernestine Rose, and she's the focus of our segment, Looking Back. Looking Back. So Ernestine Rose was a pretty impressive person. They were born on January 13th, 1810. They were a follower of Owenism, which is kind of this a utopian socialist philosophy. Um, they were married to a liberal Christian, but they were notable for being a feminist, a suffragist, an abolitionist, an atheist, and a free thinker, which is quite a list for the mid-1800s. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They were relatively unknown compared to some of the other faces in the women's rights movement, but they were friends with Susan B. Anthony and were inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1996. So quite the impressive resume just from the get-go. Um, and I, I really enjoyed reading about some of what she did. Um What did you guys find most interesting about Ernestine Louise Rose? Um, I didn't even know what the heck Owenism was until I had to Wikipedia it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and um, even like looking up to even who the person who started it was uh, a Robert Owens uh, and who was a Scots, a Scotsman and, um, and how he was really like, utilizing like um even though like he was a rich person uh how he really was like imagining like you know creating like a utopian society where you know ba- basically where you know people could live like equally and i i really love that she was really about that particular like we say in the community she about that life right so <laughs> she was really about like talking about uh, making sure like you know equal uh, equal sensibilities and, and rights for for women way before her time, and also like a staunch staunch uh, speaker against uh, slavery at that time. Like I I never even like you know you had like you know, uh, um, and I understand that they were like white abolitionists too, but even somebody for to talking about that um, as early as like the the early eighteen hundreds and um, and and being a woman. Um, and being an atheist and being all these particular things that, you know, I, this woman was like ahead of her time. And I think that if she was alive today, we would be friends. I think so too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely love reading about women, especially back in the 19th century, who were very outspoken and who challenged that authority and who challenged, especially the male dominance of that time. Um, Because you had, in in a a time, especially back then, where women were supposed to have this place, right? You weren't supposed to speak up again about these things. And I, I absolutely love reading, and I'm a history buff, and I love reading about women, especially those who were non-believers, who were atheists, and who actually were outspoken atheist. Um, I'd love reading about anyone who was very, uh, she sounds very similar to uh, Robert Ingersoll, um, mm-hmm. who was uh, very anti-slavery as well. And also Thomas Paine, I read that as well. But to know that there were women out there who did speak up and who represented our position mm-hmm. and uh, and who are basically saying the things that we're saying now, which lets us know that there's nothing new under the sun, that mm-hmm. there have always been people saying and advocating for the same things that we have. Um, it, it's always, it, it's just always amazing to, to read and learn more about, and also to learn about more of the things. I never heard of Owenism either, but um, you know, it's good to go back into history and, and educate ourselves on some of the people and the things so that for those who don't know, um, they can learn more about them. So I think that was pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. I, um, it, it, I think it's good to note that um, this was not a person of no means. Um, her mother did die um, at an, um, early. She was, uh, Rose was 16 when her mother passed and left her uh, quite a bit of money, which at that point in time, then her her father wanted to marry her off um, to someone that she did not want to marry. And so she decided to leave, uh, went to Great Britain, I believe, went to Europe to uh, and furthered her education. And that's where she um, was introduced to Owenism and, and met her future husband at an Owenism rally, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Um, it's it's really interesting, and when someone has the ability to improve their their life and um, to to educate themselves, what they can do, I think it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe that rally was like the early, like you know, atheist mingle instead of Christian mingle. 
Yeah, no. <laughs> well, what, what really leapt out to me was this this one speech that she gave. In 1861, she gave a speech that was uh, in defense of atheism. And I can see, reading through it, I can see why she was a popular speaker. Because she had spunk. And she was... Just the words that she put into this were very challenging, especially for the time. And I, I pulled a few quotes out that I really liked, and I did not read the whole thing. I'm going to go back and finish it because I only had the chance to read about a third of it. But I pulled these quotes out of just a bit, and I'm sure there's more as you keep on going. But things that we could still say today, truth, is, o truth only is beneficial, and error from whatever source and under whatever name is pernicious to man. Or, it was a great mistake to say that God made man in his image. Man in all ages made God in his own image. And we find that just in accordance with his civilization, his knowledge, his experience, his taste, his refinement, his sense of right, of justice, of freedom and humanity, so has he made his God. And my favorite quote that I pulled out of it was, Revelation tells us that God made man perfect and found him imperfect. Then he pronounced all things good and found them most desperately bad. I just, I thought that one was really funny. Uh, <laughs> illustrating sort of that, that flip-flop between there. But, you know, she touched on so many things. She mentioned many different fields of science in this speech, of math, um, just talking about, hey, you, you can't find God here. You can't find God there. Sort of filling in the God of the gaps in a little bit uh, of a sense. Um, she touched on the pro the problem of evil with the serpent, with Adam and Eve, and how, hey, if if uh, if he knew that that would happen, then his knowledge was at fault. If he did but couldn't prevent it, then his power was at fault. And if he knew and could stop it but wouldn't, then his goodness was at fault. I'm reading through this. I'm like, man, I may I I don't use language nearly as good as this, but. I make these same arguments today when I'm talking to Christians. Clearly, this she she knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I really I think there are some definitely some stuff here that I really want to read. That's uh, from her um her her writings, um, such like uh, "Mistress of Herself: Speeches and Letters of Ernestine Rose" by uh, an early woman's rights leader. Um, that's by Paula Dorset. But yeah, some of these other ones, um, American atheist, Ernestine Rose, a troublesome female. Uh, these are some stuff that I really, really want to read. Yeah, and and uh, we can, I, I think we have a few links to some things and, and we can leave those in the description, uh, either names or links or whatever we can find um, in the description or the comments of the video. Um, but I mean, I just find that she was such an impressive person, such an important person throughout history. And it was, she was not as well known as someone like Susan B. Anthony mm -hmm. or like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Those, those are like the big names, but she was just as important and more people should know about her. And especially people who are in the atheist and free thinker communities, we should know about her because she is so cool. Uh, like in, in 1869, it, uh, she lobbied for some legislation in New York that allowed married, married women to retain property and have equal guardianship of children. Like, that's big. Women wouldn't mm -hmm. be where they are today without her help. And yeah. that's, it, it's incredible, really. Mm -hmm. True that. I think that she could have taught, you know, I, I believe that in the article they, uh, that she was a, a mentor, I want to say, of Susan B. Anthony. I believe that it said that, if I'm not mistaken. I saw a friend. I, 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 yeah. I saw a friend. I don't remember a mentor, but it, it might have yeah. been there. Yeah. It may well, have. Yeah. Well, she could have learned a thing or two from that woman because I'm telling you, she was something else. I said we would be friends. We would have been friends. I, I would probably say that after reading about her, if I had to make one of those, you know, if you could have dinner with any three people throughout history... Ernestine definitely makes my top three list. Mm -hmm. I I think that she would be so interesting to talk to. Um, and she held so many, frankly, radical positions 
for the time. I wonder what she would, what sort of positions she would hold today, right? Because if she was that radical back in the early mid 1800s, where would she be now? Would she be further left than Bernie Sanders? Would she be? I I really want to know, and I wonder if anyone's kind of put in the work to try to figure that out. I think that she would have gave a lot of the uh, uh, the evangelicals that of, of prominence a run for their money. I, I can really see her doing that now. Yeah, yeah, I would hope so. But we are closing on the end of our time today. We we've uh, covered a lot of ground here. We talked about Ernestine Rose, who we all kind of agree was super cool. We talked about vaccines quite a bit and how, you know, some people have this distrust for them and also some of the um, combination of medical malpractice and just inequality, inequity in the medical community, especially as that pertains to Black Americans. Um, And that's all, I guess, kind of ties back to why Mandisa and Black non-believers together are just such an important organization that play such a crucial role of bringing people together for community without religion, for education, for promoting things like skepticism and creating a home for the people that need it. Um, and at the end, I whenever I'm hosting, I, I like to kind of see if we can find a theme for today. Um, but to be honest, I'm having trouble thinking of one. Do you guys have any thoughts? What What was our theme today? Hmm. Um, um, is it, free- would it be moving forward? Or, I mean, it, something like that, Mo- moving forward. I like that. It's moving, yeah. Moving forward. We're, we're moving forward. That even goes back to to what we talked about at the very beginning. It's 2021. It's a new year. We're going to have a new Congress, a new president. We're going to have new opportunities, old opportunities still here, of course, but all kinds of new stuff. Let's move forward and try to make a better world together if we can. Um, I do want to make sure that before we leave, I do want to do a quick plug for our Facebook group, Nonprofits Live. You can find us so that you can connect with us. Uh, Discord, there's the Atheist Community of Discord, is um, an amazing group that Malty is involved in very heavily. Um, And then, of course, Patreon, where you can support us. And once again, the Black Nonbelievers Fundraiser, where you can support Mandisa and her organization, um, because we are trying to help them. You can donate, once again, on the YouTube link or on the YouTube video for Atheist Experience Talk Heathen or the Truth Wanted that aired on Friday. Um, Mandisa, do you have any closing thoughts, anything that you'd like to just plug or say about Black non-believers that maybe we didn't get to? Um, first, I'd like to thank you all again for having me as a guest on the show. I really enjoyed it. And um, you can't really see the um, the back of my um my my board here, but it has our hashtag, which is being changes lives. And we launched this hashtag and our, that, that campaign in 2017, because we have heard over the years from our members who said that not, not only have we changed their lives, but we've saved their lives. Mm -hmm. And I remember not getting into this community to be a savior. That, that, that's just too much work. I'm not God, right? You know, my name isn't Jesus or anything. I'm not putting that on myself. That's a lot of work. And as Black women, we already have a lot of work that that is put on our shoulders. But right. um, <laughs> yeah, <you're, laughs> however, um, when I hear that and when I hear people express how much our organization has impacted them for the better, um, that lets me know that what we're doing is important and that helps, that keeps me moving forward. You know, that keeps me going, that keeps me wanting to help help others 
and help uh, continue to strengthen our team, help continue to strengthen our collaborations, our conspiracies that we do with others, you know, making that good trouble, like John Lewis said, you know, and, and, and making sure that we keep, you know, we make our voices heard and, and continue to stay out there. And uh, before I end, um, I just want to mention that the ACA's uh, fundraiser is a matching donation so that they'll be matching dollar for dollar up to 10,000. So please do support this effort. It is much needed and appreciated to help our work. So thank you all again, once again, very much for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Mandisa. Thank you also, Malti and Cynthia, for joining me today. Um, I know it's been a uh, it, it's been a day, and I'm just glad that we got to do this. Um, makes me makes me feel a little better. Hopefully, everyone else can find that same community that makes them happy. And if you don't have one, join ours. Thanks, everyone, and good night.